if you could open up to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1. Uh, we're just going to look at a few verses here this morning uh, as Steve gets ready to, to present his uh, uh, section here. But we're in lesson four now of the Life of Christ Challenge. And as we continue on here with this challenge, um, we're going to start to finally get into the scriptures. We've been doing all of the background stuff. But to me, the background stuff is just as important as the scriptures because it helps us to have a little bit better understanding of the, uh, of the times and the political culture, the climate, the, the geography that, that Christ was born into and that, that, that he lived uh, through for the first 30 years of his life uh, that prepared him for his ministry. So it gives us a lot of background information and now we're going to start to get into the beginnings of the Gospels. Today's uh, first lesson, we're going to be in lesson four, but then we probably will get to lesson five um, and we'll hand out those sheets next week. Um, but in lesson four, we're going to start to really look at some of the introductions. Uh, and he's going to start with Luke, and then we're going to get into some of the genealogies. We're going to talk about that, uh, the differences in the gene genealogies, and, and really what that means. So, Steve, if you'd like to take over, buddy. Uh, open up to Luke. Um, chapter one. Chapter one, verses one through four. If I can get go. Um, Got to get this cable fixed here. You want me to read that for you? Go ahead. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 says this, and then I'll have Steve take over. And as much as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seems fitting for me as well having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke was looking at things from a standpoint that there were many people that had their view of Christ's life. When you take into consideration that there were eyewitnesses and servants that handed down their accounts, realizing that uh, when they were all in the upper room after Christ had ascended, right, they had 120 people and each had their own ideas of Christ's life. Each of the apostles had more information than probably many of that 120 people, but each may have had their own personal thoughts and stories to tell. Luke took it upon himself to investigate those stories. He talked to Jesus' family. He talked to Mary. He probably talked to James and his other brothers and sisters. He talked to many different people. He may have even gone as far as to talk to some of the enemies of Jesus, or at least listen to some of the stories that were told. He had to put down what was being said so that Theophilus would have a full accounting of what was being said about Jesus so that we today have the full story. He studied what was available to him. And in writing to Theophilus uh, as being designated as the most excellent because Theophilus may have been a leader in the community, someone who had some authority or uh, official of, of high standing. His name means lover of God. So each of us could be called Theophilus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are lovers of God. Um, he may have been well enough off or rich enough that he was a patron of Luke, supported him during this time that he was writing this book, 
uh, just in a physical manner, supporting him, mm -hmm. to seeing to his physical needs, seeing to it that he had all of the necessary pen and paper, quill and paper, ink, his food, clothing, housing, this type of thing. But more importantly, that he had the ability to travel and to go to places, to talk to these people, and to get all of the information that he needed. Now, one of the questions that I had was, who taught Theophilus? Because he had the story, he knew about Jesus, mm -hmm. he was a lover of God, was he a Jew that he already knew God? Was he a proselyte? Was he someone that believed from the study or from the teachings of John the Baptist? But who had taught Theophilus? Was it Luke? Was it one of the, the apostles? That was something I thought about. Uh, also, when you think about that, how was it that Theophilus and Luke came together? Had they been friends prior to this? Because Luke was a educated man. Maybe he had had dealings with Theophilus prior to the coming of Christ. So many things came to my mind. Uh, but Theophilus and, and Luke had dealings in my, my thinking that allowed him to put this book together. And if it hadn't been for that, we might not have these writings. And another question I had was, was the Holy Spirit behind that pen? I have to think so. Was Luke in that upper room? We don't know, but <coughs> was the Holy Spirit guiding Luke in all of his writings? All right, so let's answer a couple of those questions that Steve proposed, right? Let's start with the last one. How can we know if the Holy Spirit was behind the pen of Luke? What does scripture say? Because it's in the book, these scriptures, because it's in here. It yeah. has to be. Right? So it starts with, it's in the Bible. If God has the power to raise somebody from the dead, if God has the power to create the heavens and the earth, and to create life and all that we know it, don't you think he could probably figure out what kind of books he wants in his own Bible? Right? What does the Bible say about the Word of God? It's God breathed, it's inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, amen? Yeah. Right? For all scriptures, what? God breathed. It says it's inspired, profitable for training, uh, for correction, for uh, training up and raising up in righteousness, right? So we know that. We know that uh, 2 Thessalonians, I think it is, uh, 1 in 20. Um, is it 2 Thessalonians 1 in 20? No, I think I got the wrong book there. Uh, 2 Peter 1 in 20, I believe it is, 20 and 21. It talks about no prophecy of Scripture was ever uh, an act of one's own will, but men who were moved by the Holy Spirit of God spoke from God, right? So we know that Luke's writings are from God, and he was guided in this. Uh, one of the other questions that he asked was, uh, you know, can we know who the uh, Theophilus was? And the answer is really no. Um, most of our best uh, scholars, as far as the, uh, theologians and uh, historians, um, they, they could make guesses as to who he may have been. They know that he was probably an official because most excellent was, uh, uh, was a, a designation for some form of official, right? Uh, Luke was, we know that he was educated. He was a doctor. Uh, we know that he's a, his, he was an historian. Uh, he was an educated man. So he was probably a man of higher stature uh, just because the, the elite, the educated, uh, generally, if you were educated in that first century, you came from influence or you came from uh, maybe a, a, a family that was a little bit more well-to-do. Um, as we look at some of the other questions, I'm trying to think what you said what was the other one. Um, 
there's a proof. So. Was he in the upper room? Oh, was he in the upper room? Again, we don't know. It's a, it's a thing that it says that, uh, that was he in the upper room? Nobody knows. It doesn't give a, a, a list of all 120 people. We know mm -hmm. that Mary and the, the disciples, we know the apostles were in the upper room, mm -hmm. but we don't really know who all was in the upper room. But we also know that, uh, what, what can we also know about, uh, why is eyewitness uh, testimony so very important, right? Uh, you know, he was talking, you, you asked the question and you made the comment about uh, those, uh, you know, where did he get all his information, right? Well, that was going back to Acts chapter 1 when they chose Judas, right? Acts chapters 1 and 2, when they had to replace the office of Judas, right? His apostleship. What was the requirement in order to replace him? Eyewitnesses. Right? Eyewitnesses from the beginning. Eyewitnesses. Individual who had to be, it's individuals who would have had to have been with Christ from the beginning. The beginning of what? What, what was the beginning? His ministry, but it goes back to his baptism, right? And so somebody out of that 120, and out of the 120, only two people met the qualifications. And so uh, we know that, uh, that it fell on Matthias, but the, the lots fell on him. But only two people out of the 120 met the qualifications as to be disciples who had been there and seen everything from the beginning. That was important because now, if you've seen all these things from the beginning, I could give eyewitness testimony. It's not something that I've heard from somebody who heard from somebody who heard, right? Have you guys ever heard something from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody who heard it from somebody? It from somebody, it from somebody? What happens to that translation of what they heard? Changes. Changes. Isn't that where we get the idea lost in translation? Right, that's where we get the phrase from, because it becomes distorted. And that's why it was so very important that when we look at this first section, uh, that, that Luke's information was, uh, was received from eyewitness testimony. Now we get into the second section as we change the slide here on the screen behind us. We're going to start to look at some of the genealogies of Matthew and Luke. And Matthew's account was written primarily for Jews, okay? We know this. We've already talked about this. His, his lineage was focused on proving that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the promised Messiah, uh, and he looks at Jewish, uh, Jewish heritage. We also know that as you study out uh, the, uh, Matthew's gospel, and you really get to Matthew chapter 1, where his, gene his genealogy is recorded, we find what, uh, what some historians will call uh, the family tree, right? And we can see that the tree is rooted in some of the great, uh, the great patriarch as well as the greatest king uh, in, 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 in Israel's history. And who was the greatest patri patriarch in Israel's history? Abraham. Abraham. Who was the greatest king in Israel's uh, history? David. David. And so we're going to see that, uh, that, Matthew's, uh, that Matthew's lineage, which is oftentimes thought of as the legal line, versus the royal line, we're going to see how you know, Abraham and David are in there. We also know that uh, the messianic lineage was according to prophecy. Uh, he was, Jesus was, de, uh, he was a descendant of Abraham. We know that if you were to look back to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, the scriptures tell us, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. But notice that he uses the word seed and not seeds. Well, that's important because even the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And notice even Paul says, he does not say and seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to, and to your seed, and that is Christ. And so he's talking about how he was, Jesus was a descendant of Abraham. It goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 22. Uh, we also know that uh, Jesus was a descendant of, of David. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 uh, and verse 16, the scriptures tell us, Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever. Before, it shall endure before me forever, talking about God the Father. Your throne shall be established forever. Why do you think, uh, what's the point of Samuel uh, making that messianic prophecy about forever? Your seed, your throne will be established forever. How is that possible and how did that come about? Abrahamic covenant. Abrahamic covenant. And so Jesus being the seed, right? Was Jesus the, the last in the, 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 in the kings to sit on the throne? 
in the lineage of David? Forever. Huh? Jesus is the last king forever. Yeah, that sits on the throne of David, right? Yeah. And he's going to rule forever, right? And so you look at what it said there in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom, talking about Christ, shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And so he sits on the throne of David because that was prophesied. And we know that it's going to be established forever because who is Jesus? Now, he's the son of God. And so Jesus made a one-time eternal sacrifice, and he could do that because he's deity. Jesus is God in the flesh. So he could establish the throne. He could establish it forever because he's God, and he's going to live on for an eternity. Lewis? You know, I, I'm just thinking, if we were to stop right now and reflect about the first century Sunday morning class, yep. this is what is being taught. Yeah. Like we're teaching, teaching now, because you, we're bringing on board the history and the genealogy of Christ. Yep. And a lot of people are new to the church, well, no, no, not all Gentiles, but, but we have to refresh those who are Jews and say, this is why you believe what you believe. Yeah. And I always was wondering what they taught in Sunday school. Yeah. Well, I think this is a reflection upon it, and it might be also what we reflect upon in the worship also. Yeah. But we, we, we have to learn the way they had to learn. Yeah, I think it's in Acts chapter 17, I could be wrong, but I know it's right, right in that section um, where uh, the Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the Bereans, right? And, and it says we need to be like the Bereans. Why? He says, because when I brought all the information that I brought to them, it says they studied it day and night to see if the things in which he had said were in fact true. How much stronger would Christianity be and how many less people would be in denominations versus the Lord's church if they spent day and night studying to see if the things in which we say are actually true? Studying to see if the things that anybody who stands in any pulpit teaching on behalf of God and the Holy Scriptures, if they studied to see if the things that they were taught were true. In my sermon today, we're going to talk about and we're going to focus on the life of Mary. We're going to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, and so just think about the statement I just said. What if people actually took the time to verify the, uh, the validity of the things that they are told versus the things that the Bible actually teaches? It would change Christianity forever. Thoughts? Yeah. Uh, the falsities that were taught have been passed down from generation to generation, and it's been accepted because my parents believed it, my grandparents yep. believed it, and that's exactly what you're talking about. The trust is based in individuals and not in the scripture. Yeah. And people simply don't examine the scripture. Yep. And somewhere along the line, one generation or the next generation has tweaked it a little bit to mm -hmm. suit their circumstances, and that has changed it that much more. Yeah. Amen. Another thing to think about is, as we think about these comments, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul warns young Timothy, an evangelist, who after, second, you know, after his second letter to Timothy, Paul's going to go to his death. And so he's writing his final instructions and encouragement to young Timothy. And he tells them, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for you do, as you do this, you will ensure salvation, not just for yourself, but also for those who hear you. So you look at that passage of Scripture, it will ensure salvation for yourself and those who hear you. But what happens if he doesn't pay close attention to his teachings? He starts to teach what he feels versus what he knows to be true. Then all of a sudden, the message is going to take on a very different meaning. And it's going to affect his salvation. It's going to affect the salvation of those who sit at his feet. Amen? And so we look at this, we get back into the, some of the information for the genealogies. And we know mm. that uh, when we look at the messianic lineage, according to prophecy, we, look, we talked about Genesis 22, 2 Samuel chapter 7, but we also need to look at and think about, uh, there were some surprises in the genealogies. Did you know that there's Canaanites in the genealogy 
of, of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1? Did you know there's a Moabite in the genealogy uh, for uh, Christ in Matthew chapter 1? Why is that interesting? Why is that? Why would I say that's a surprise? Stephen? They're not Jews. And not only they're not Jews, but they, they were like the, 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 some of the greatest enemies of the Jews. And yet, Canaanite and Moabites find themselves in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1. We'll talk about it a little more in a second. But there's also another surprise. You guys, ever, you guys remember hearing about the wicked king Manasseh? The wicked king Manasseh finds himself in the genealogy of Christ. And so you think about that for a second, right? That simply shows how God's mercy will be upon all individuals who repents and show remorse for their actions. Because even though Manasseh was one of the more wicked kings throughout the divided kingdom, especially in the southern kingdom of Judah, we know at the end, before his death, he repented. And God had rescued him. He went back to Judah, uh, out of uh, where, he, where he was taken captive, and he started to reform. He started to make some changes. He started to correct some of the error in which he had entered uh, into. He started to remove some of the idolatry. And so we see, though, even though he was wicked for most of his time, his remorse and his uh, uh, contrite heart was heard and seen by God. Anybody else in Scripture meet that description? Huh? Paul? Saul? Who else? The greatest king in Israel's history. David. David. Did he get to a point where he's a little bit full of himself? He starts to take other men's wives, right? And then he commits murder, and he does all these uh, horrible things in the sight of God. But then he repents with a, a, a sincere and contrite heart. He sin uh, sincere in his repent, sincere in his remorse. God understands and knows his heart. And it says that David, he goes on to say that David's a man after my own heart. So you can just see as you look at the genealogies, there's some, there are some surprises in here, like the Moabites and the Canaanites, and as well as even Manasseh. Uh, hand? Go ahead. I was just going to make a comment on it that just kind of hit me when you were saying that. Is, well, that's when uh, all the stuff going on now yeah. in, in life, um, it's easy to get very depressed by what's going on, but to see that there were evil, so much evil back then, and God used it still to his glory. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Some of, them, some of them didn't repent, some did. Yeah. So you just yeah. never know. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in the genealogy. Steve? Okay. What were you going to say? Well, when <coughs> Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, straight is the way, but narrow is the, the path. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some of us are going to make it, some of us are not. Amen. So we, get, we keep going to Matthew's genealogy. Matthew's genealogy is divided into three parts. Abraham to David, from David to the deportation. What do I mean by the deportation? Babylon. I'm sorry? Captivity. Captivity. Babylon. Yep, Babylon, Ex exactly. That's what, that's what it was. And then from the deportation to Jesus. Each section contains 14 names or 14 generations uh, as, you, as you break down the genealogy. Um, and so uh, as you get there, and you look really more deeply into Matthew's genealogy, it kind of goes all the way back, right? Righteous men, as I said earlier, Abraham and David, but, but several who stand out, uh, and as we talk about the, the Moabitess, as we talk about the Canaanites, these are three women. Two Canaanite, one Moabite. Let's have a little trivia and see if we can figure out who are the two Canaanite women that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 and his genealogy. And who is the Moabite woman who is mentioned in the genealogy? Three women, so we narrowed it down to, we eliminated all the men. <laughs> Ruth? Wait, wait, okay, Ruth is one, hold on, Barb. That's what I was going to say. Uh, okay, now who is Ruth? Moabite. She was the Moabite. Moabite. Now there's two Canaanite women, hold on, uh, Gina and then Carrie. Uh, Rahab, Rahab is one, um, Carrie. I was going to say Rahab too. Rahab, and there's one more. <laughs> No, nope, not Bathsheba. Rahab, Bathsheba. Go back a little bit further, and you hear of a woman named Tamar. Yeah. Yeah. You guys remember Tamar? Yeah. What do we remember about Tamar? And we're not going to do a study on Tamar, but just <laughs> since, since she was the last one we thought of, what do we remember about Tamar? 
She was the, the daughter-in-law of Judah, who then, uh, Judah's sons treated her, well, her husband died, and then the other son treated her horribly, but because they had no children, he says, if you just go and wait, I'll give you my third son, the youngest son. But he's a little bit young now to have a wife, so you're going to have to wait a little bit. Well, as years gone by, she realized that uh, he, wasn't going, he wasn't going to honor his promise. So she dressed herself up, pretended to be a prostitute, and then he has relations with her. And, 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 she, and he said, basically, she made him give him his staff, his signet ring, and, and I think it was like a cloak or something. And so when she was found to be pregnant, he was going to have her put to death. But she said, hey, but the man who promised me, these are the things that belong to him. And he immediately realized they were his and he had to be deceived. And so that's how she ends up in the genealogy um, of Christ. And so those are the three. Uh, as we think about this, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a historian named uh, Geyer, and he observed and he said this. The Savior's family tree had its share of blights and barrenness, bent twigs and broken branches. What do you think he means by that? That it was not straight. Imperfections. Imperfections. Yeah? Hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I thought I seen your hand up. No? Intermarriages. Intermarriages, okay. One thing I'm teaching about the Bible. If you're going to write a good st a story about something you want to be good, you write all the good stuff. Yeah. Put all the good stuff in. God says, no. I'm like, this is what it was. This yeah. is how it happened. And this, it's uh, the good, ugly, and the, and the bad. Yeah. And that's what's good about the scriptures. And what, Amen. It's never put perfume on a pig. Yeah. And we got to continue. <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't. I'm God, David did yeah. what he did. You say perfume on a pig? That's yeah, what perfume. He said. I'm writing that down. I've heard lipstick on a pig with the perfume. perfume. So now we're going to put some perfume and lipstick. Oh, yeah. Boy, that's looking good now. Yeah. But the perfume, but God always has truth. And he doesn't have to worry about retreading and this world. I, I kind of built that up a little bit. No, yeah. it was what it was. Yeah. And I think if we take the truth of God and do it the same way, let it speak for itself. Amen. And not try to put perfume on it, we'll be okay. Well, this gentleman, Geyer, he goes on to say, if we ever needed proof that God can accomplish his purposes in spite of mankind's weaknesses <laughs> and in spite of our stubbornness, it is generally supplied for us in Matthew's genealogy. And that is the legal genealogy. Now we get to Luke. Luke in chapter 3, uh, Luke's account had a different purposes than Matthew's, right? Matthew's is often thought of as the legal Line, Luke's ends with Christ's genealogy. It ends with Adam to show that Jesus is his connection all the way uh, through, through the, the first individual Adam and for all mankind. So the two lists, as you look at Matthew's genealogy and Luke's, they're very different. Um, they both show Abraham and David, but those names um, in different, the names in between David and Abraham are very different. And so why is that? Well, um, going back and understanding what some of these historians who have studied this out in detail have said, these are some of their thoughts. Matthew gives the legal line through Joseph for the Jews. Jesus was Joseph's legal son uh, on earth, but not his fleshly son. So Jesus, was, uh, Jesus' only father was God. Luke gives the fleshly line through Mary, which others also have called the royal line. And so as you look at this, Mary is not mentioned in Luke. Because, and as well as some of the other women, because women are generally not mentioned in the genealogies. But in Matthew's genealogy, because it was the legal line, they had to show how these other individuals made it into the genealogy, even though they came about through Canaanite and Moabite women. And so that's the reason why they're in there, to show the legal line. Uh, Matthew stressed the, uh, the legal descendants, while Luke stressed the fleshly uh, or the royal descendants of David. And so the, the two genealogies, you can see that they very easily fulfill what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16 that I spoke of earlier, that your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Now Steve's going to continue on with our next set of points. Why don't you turn your Bibles to John, first chapter, starting at verse 1. John took a little bit different tact in his study of the lineage or the story of that, of Jesus. He said, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Rather than looking at the earthly lineage, he started back with the, the, the divine lineage of Jesus, seeing that it was the fact that he was before the beginning. He was at the beginning. He, he didn't start in Bethlehem. He was there in the beginning with God and the Holy Spirit. He started in eternity. Now, we divide that this introduction into three divisions. Jesus as the eternal word, that's in verses one through three. He's the light who overrules the darkness of this world. And Jesus, the revelation of God to men. So let's read the first few verses. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that was come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of the men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, well, Jesus, <clears throat> as the word, what did that mean to us? as Christians today. When he came into the world, he came in for one reason. That was to save us. But as the word, what did that mean to the, to the first century people? He brought them the word of God. Some listened, some didn't. In verse 1, he said, he is God. He did many wonderful things to prove that he was God. Some believed, some didn't. He is creator, and that's in verse 3. If he didn't create everything, we wouldn't be here. Now, In verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of, of men. The life. How was life given? <coughs> Through the breath of God. Through the breath of God. Jesus was God. When he, they created man, when God said, Let us make man in our image. God... Jesus and the Holy Spirit were eternal beings. Man would have been an eternal being if they hadn't messed up in the garden. Mm -hmm. But they breathed into that created being with the breath of life. He is light. How many of you were afraid of the dark when you were a kid? How many of you are afraid of the dark now? <laughs> I mean, when it's really, really dark, how many of you keep a light on in the house at night? My wife has at least three. Okay? So, and, and the doctor tells me I should have at least one light that is on in the house so that I can see so I don't Trip and stub my toe. <laughs> but I can see as I walk around the house at night. But the light in the darkness. But what darkness are we supposed to be afraid of? Darkness of sin. Darkness of sin. Amen. And who's who's the the controller of that darkness? Satan. 
Satan controls that darkness and he's, if he takes that control and puts it in our hearts, what happens to us? The light is snuffed out. The light in our hearts can be snuffed out. But what do we do to stop that? Walk in the light as he is in the light. Walk in the light as he is in the light. That's Jesus. And what <coughs> can we say to that, that darkness? Get thee behind me. Get, get thee behind me, Satan. Because Jesus is there to lead us and be with us. One second, though. When you ask, you know, you know, what can we do, that's where it gets back. Uh, you know, Carrie got the book, bookmarks that a lot of people picked up last week. And one of the bookmarks were on the armor of God. Why is the armor of God important? So you need it every day. Fight the good fight. You need it every day. Fight the good fight. <laughs> Defeat Satan. Defeat Satan. Satan. All right. And so we have to put on the, the full armor of God. And if, you're, if you put on the full armor of God, you're able to say, get behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. And guess what he's going to have to do? He's going to have to listen. And so, that's a topic that <clears throat> John talks about several times in the book of John. Amen. Christ being the light of men, yep. being the light to salvation. And it's, it's something that we probably don't use often enough, is using our faith to make that statement when that temptation confronts us. And we have to have that faith and use it when we, when we feel low, when we feel confused. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote often in Romans, you know, he wanted the Roman to develop a faith that would lead to obedience. And that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. One more thing before you move on. Uh, in regards to some of the names, he mentioned the word, right? Which, you know, the word mean logos. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which is, you know, our word for logic, where we get our word for logic. But the other two things that Jesus is often identified as, as the Christ. What does the Christ mean? Same Messiah. Huh? Same. Anointed one. Anointed. So Christ means anointed one. What does the name Jesus mean? Jehovah Son saves. Jesus. Christ and Jesus, right? Oftentimes, how often do we say Christ Jesus? Christ, the anointed one who God had sent into the world to save mankind, right? So Jehovah saves, anointed. And so when you think about Christ Jesus, think about Christ the anointed, who God has used to save the world, because Jehovah saves is what it means. Go ahead. Okay. Look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, but of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus is Savior, as we've been talking about. Jesus saves. Jesus came to the earth to become our sacrifice. He is here not just to save us once and but for all time. He is our lamb. He's the perfect sacrifice that Jesus, that God wanted and was willing to give. That's what we need to remember at all times. He was flesh that is man, that in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among <coughs> us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was deity, living in heaven with his Father and with the Holy Spirit. He gave all of that up to come to earth and to live as man, to feel what it was like and to be tempted as we are tempted. And those 40 days he spent in the desert, that wasn't the only time that he was tempted. I'm sure that during out his entire life, he still faced temptations, but he didn't give in to any of that. And he continued to live the way that we should live. He always... was the perfect example 
with the things that we needed to do. He's the only begotten of the Father, still in verse 14. He's the provider of grace and truth, that's in verse 17. He is God, the Father manifested, that's in verse 18. Get to that quick before we (coughs) go any further. Verse 18, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Jesus came so that the disciples, the apostles, could say that they had seen God through Jesus. He gave them that advantage so that they could know that he was God. We need to remember that Jesus came for us, and that's the the story that John gave us in the book of John. We need to remember (laughs) that. I'm just going to close this down. Yeah. We're about to run out of time. So we're going to pick up in Lesson 5 next week. Uh, The the list that you see on the screen behind me is the list that Steve just went through. These are the different designations of uh, of Jesus that John uses in his gospel. And I love in in, uh, the the number 6 where it says he is Savior in John 1 and 12. It makes me think of even what Mary said in what's called the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1 and verse 46 when she has like the song of Hannah, right? It's her song. Uh, as she praises God and gives uh, uh, glory to God. She, and Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God. And she says, My Savior. Let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We are so blessed and so thankful for this opportunity to study your word, study it in depth, uh, look to have a deeper understanding. And uh, Father, and I just pray that each of us continue to study as we go home. Uh, so we could use this information with our friends, our family, our coworkers, just all we come in contact with, Father, to let people know uh, that your Son is the light of the world and to let them know that he is the Savior of the world. Father, we just pray that you give us the courage to speak out on behalf of Christ Jesus and behalf of the kingdom to your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone.